Sylvia, what started you writing poetry? I don't know what started me. I, I just uh, wrote it from the time I was quite small. I guess I liked nursery rhymes, and I guess I thought I could sort of do the same thing. I wrote my first poem, my first published poem, when I was eight and a half. It came out in the Boston Traveler. And uh, from then on, I, I suppose I've been a bit of a professional. What sort of things did you write about when you began writing poetry? Um, nature, I think. Birds, bees, spring, fall, all those subjects which are absolute gifts to the... Um, person who doesn't have, you know, sort of any interior experiences to write about. I think that the coming of spring, the stars overhead, first snowfall and so on are gifts for a child, you know, a young poet. Now, jumping the years, can you say are there any themes which particularly attract you now as a poet, things that you feel you would like to write about? Perhaps this is an American thing. I've been very excited by what I feel is the new breakthrough that came with, say, Robert Lowell's life studies, this intense breakthrough into very serious, very personal emotional experience, which I feel has been partly taboo. Robert Lowell's poems about um, his experiences in a mental hospital, for example, interest me very much. These peculiar, private and taboo subjects uh, I feel have been explored in recent American poetry, I think particularly of the poetess Anne Sexton, who um, writes also about her experiences as a mother, as a mother who's had a nervous breakdown, as an extremely emotional and feeling young woman. And her poems are wonderfully craftsmanlike poems, and yet they have a kind of emotional and psychological depth, which I think is something perhaps quite new, quite exciting. Now, you as a poet, and as a person to straddle the Atlantic, if I can put it that way, being an American yourself... That's a rather awkward position, but <laughs> I'll accept it. <laughs> um, on which side does your weight fall, if I can pursue the metaphor? Well, uh, I think that as far as language goes, I'm an American. I'm afraid I'm an American. My accent's American. My way of talk is an American way of talk. I'm an old-fashioned American. I, that's probably one of the reasons why I'm in England now and why I always stay in England. I'm about 50 years behind as far as my uh, preferences go. And I must say the poets that excite me most are the Americans. There are very few contemporary English poets that, that um, I admire. Does this mean that you think contemporary English poetry is somehow behind the times when compared with America? No, I think it's in a bit of a straitjacket, if I may say so. Um, there was an essay by Alvarez, A. Alvarez, the British critic. His uh, arguments about the dangerousness of gentility in England are very pertinent, very true. And I must say that I am not very genteel, and I feel that gentility has a, has a stranglehold. The neatness, the wonderful tidiness, which is so evident everywhere in England, is perhaps more dangerous than it would appear on the surface. But don't you think, too, that there's this business of English poets who are laboring under the whole weight of something which in block capitals is called English literature? Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I know when I was at Cambridge, this, this uh, appeared to me. Young women would come up to me and say, how do you dare to write? How do you dare to publish a poem? Because of the criticism, the terrible criticism that falls upon one if one does publish. And, and the criticism is not... Um, you know, of the poem as poem. I remember being appalled when someone criticized me for beginning just like John Donne, but not quite managing to finish like John Donne. And I felt the weight of English literature on me at that point. And I think the whole um, emphasis in England, in the university, on practical criticism, uh, but not that so much as historical criticism, you know, knowing what period a line comes from, this is almost paralyzing. In America, at university, we read what? T.S. Eliot, Dylan Thomas, Yeats. That's where we began. Shakespeare <laughs> floated in the background. I, 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 not sure I agree with this, but I think that for the young poet, the writing poet, it's not quite so frightening to go to university in America as it is in England for these reasons. You say, Sylvia, that you consider yourself an American, but when we listen to a poem like Daddy, which talks about Dachau and Auschwitz and Mein Kampf. Yes, yes. Now, I have yes. the impression that this is the sort of poem that a real American 
could not have written uh, with the same feeling and grasp with which you have written it, uh, because it doesn't mean so much. These names do not, I think, mean so much on the other side of the Atlantic, do they? Well, now, uh, you're talking to me as a general American. Well, in particular, my background is, um, may I say, German and Austrian. On one side, I'm a first-generation American. On one side, I'm a second-generation American. And so my concern, I must say, with concentration camps and so on is, is uniquely intense. And uh, then again, I... I'm rather a political person as well, uh, so so I suppose that's where part of it comes from. And as a poet, do you have a great and a keen sense of the historic? I'm not a historian, but I find myself being more and more fascinated by history, and now I find myself reading more and more about history. I'm very interested in Napoleon at the present. I'm very interested in battles, in wars, in Gallipoli, or... Uh, you know, the First World War and so on, and I think that as I age, uh, I'm becoming more and more historical. I certainly wasn't at all in, in my early 20s. Do your poems tend now to come out of books rather than come out of your own life? Oh, no, no, I wouldn't say that at all. I think my poems come immediately out of the sensuous and e emotional experiences I have, but I must say I cannot uh, sympathize with these cries from the heart that are informed by nothing except, you know, a needle or a knife or whatever it is. I, I believe that one should be able to control and manipulate experiences, even the most terrifying, like madness, being tortured, this sort of experience. And one should be able to manipulate these experiences with an informed and intelligent mind. I think that personal experience is, is uh, very important. But certainly it shouldn't be a kind of shut box and sort of mirror-looking narcissistic experience. I believe it should be relevant, and relevant to the larger things, the bigger things, such as Hiroshima and Dachau and so on. So behind the primitive emotional reaction, there must be an intellectual discipline. I feel that very strongly. Having been an academic, having been tempted by... Uh, the invitation to stay on, to become a PhD, a professor, and all that, one side of me certainly does respect all disciplines, as long as they don't ossify. What about writers who've influenced you, perhaps that's the wrong word to use, have meant a lot to you? There are very few. I find it hard to trace them, really. When I was at college, I was stunned and astounded by the moderns, by Dylan Thomas, by Yeats, by Auden even. At one point I, I was absolutely wild for Auden, and uh, everything I wrote was, it was desperately Auden-esque. Uh, now, I, um, again, I begin to go backwards. I begin to look to Blake, for example. And then, of course, it's, it's presumptuous to say that one is influenced by someone like Shakespeare. One reads Shakespeare and that's that. Sylvia, one notices in reading your poems and in listening to your poems that there are two qualities which emerge very quickly and clearly. One is their lucidity, and I think these two qualities have something to do one with the other. Their lucidity and the impact they make on reading. Now, do you consciously design your poems to be both lucid and to be effective when they're read aloud? No, I don't. May I say this, that the ones I read are very recent, and I have found myself having to read them aloud to myself, saying them to myself. Now, this is something I didn't do. For example, my first book, The Colossus, I can't read any of the poems aloud now. I didn't write them to be read aloud. They, in, in fact, quite, quite privately bore me. Now, these ones that I have just read, the ones that are very recent, I've got to say them. I speak them to myself. And I think that this, in my own writing development, is quite a new thing with me. And whatever lucidity they may have comes from the fact that I say them to myself. I say them aloud. Do you think this is an essential ingredient of a good poem, that it should be able to be read aloud effectively? Well, I feel that. I do feel that now. And I feel that this development of recording poems, of speaking poems at readings, of having records of poets, I think this is a wonderful thing. I'm very excited by it. 
in a sense, there's a return, isn't there, to the old role of the poet, which was to speak to a group of people, to, to come across. Or to sing to a group. To sing to a group of people. Exactly, exactly. Setting aside poetry for a moment, are there other things that you would like to write or that you have written? Well, I've become, I shan't say I've become interested in prose, I always was interested in prose. As a teenager, I wrote short stories a lot, and I published short stories. And uh, I always wanted to write the long short story. I wanted to write a novel. Now that I uh, have attained, shall I say, uh, a respectable age and have had experiences, I feel much more interested in prose in the novel. I feel that in a novel, for example, you can get in toothbrushes and all the paraphernalia that, that one finds in daily life. And I find this more difficult in poetry. Poetry, I feel, is a tyrannical discipline. You've got to go so far, so fast, in such a small space that you've just got to burn away all the peripherals. And I miss them. I'm a woman. I like my little lares and penates. I like, I like uh, trivia, and I find that in a novel I can get more of life, perhaps not such intense life, but certainly more of life, and so I've become very interested in novel writing as a result. This is almost a Dr. Johnson sort of view, isn't it? Uh, what was it he said, that there are some things which are fit for inclusion in poetry and others which are not? Well, of course, as a poet, I would say poof, I would say everything should be able to come into a poem, but I can't can't put toothbrushes in a poem. I really can't. Do you find yourself much in the company of other writers, of poets? I much prefer doctors, midwives, lawyers, anything but writers. I think writers and artists are the, are the most narcissistic people. I, well, I, I mustn't say this. I like many of them. In fact, I, a great many of my friends happen to be writers and artists. But I must say, what I admire most, or I certainly find myself looking toward, is the person who masters an area of practical experience and can teach me something. I mean, my local midwife has taught me how to keep bees. Well, she can't understand anything I, I write. <laughs> and uh, I, I find myself liking her, may I say, more than most poets. And, and among my friends, I find these people who know all about boats or know about a certain sport or know about how to cut somebody open and remove an organ. Well, I'm fascinated by this, this mastery of the practical. And I must say, I feel as a poet, one lives a bit on air. And uh, um, I, I'm, I always like someone who can teach me something practical. Is there anything else which you would rather have done than writing poetry? Because this is something, obviously, that takes up a great deal of one's daily life if one's going to succeed at it. Do you ever have any lingering regrets that you didn't do something else? Well, I think if I had done anything else, I would have liked to be a doctor. And this is the, the sort of polar opposition to being a writer, I suppose. My best friends, as, uh, uh, when I was young, were always doctors. I used to dress up in a white gauze helmet and go around and see babies born and cadavers cut open. Well, this fascinated me, but I never could bring myself to disciplining myself to the point where I could learn all the details that one has to learn to be a good doctor. This is the, is the sort of opposition. Somebody who deals directly with human experience is able to cure, to mend, to help, this sort of thing. <laughs> I suppose if I have any nostalgia, it's this, but I console myself because I know so many doctors, and I may say that I think perhaps I'm happier writing about doctors than I would have been being one. But basically, this thing, the writing of poetry, is something which has been a great satisfaction to you in your life, is it? Oh, satisfaction, yes. I don't think I could live without it. It's like, you know, water or bread or something absolutely essential to me. I find myself absolutely fulfilled when I have written a poem, when I'm writing one. Having written one, well, then you fall away very rapidly from having been a poet to becoming a sort of uh, poet in rest, which isn't the same thing at all. But I think the actual experience of writing a poem is a magnificent one.